Hello plant lovers, it is Matthew in Melbourne welcoming you back to my channel. Thank you very much for finding me. And if you're new here, I grow cold, cool, intermediate orchids here in Melbourne, Australia without a greenhouse or grow lights or humidifiers, just me and them either indoors or outdoors or not at all. So if that sounds like your bag, do hit subscribe. I post every Friday. I'm a complete amateur. And my ramblings are really about how I've discovered the things that work for me and my climate. So of course, they'll be different for you wherever you are. But if there are some similarities and overlaps, hopefully these very rambly videos might help. And today, plant lovers, ta-da, on Cidium Central, a few of mine are in bloom. Some have just finished, some haven't started, and some are seedlings. So I thought, why not? Let's have a little deep dive back into Oncidiums and just have a look at their life cycle, the repotting, when you should do that, when they might flower, general care and conditions, because these are all sort of different stages of their cycle. And with hybrid Oncidiums, that is quite the case. You can get multiple flowerings in a year. You can get multiple growth spurts in the year. So how do you manage that? Well, this is how I manage it, which might not be how you manage it. Totally depends on your climate and how and what you're able to grow. But let's begin. So in this video, we're going to revise the life cycle of plants, when they might flower, when the new growths might appear. Do they need a rest period? Do they not? And when is the best time to repot them? Without further ado, well, let's dive in. So I guess first cab off the rank is Oncidiums. Now there is this banner title called the Oncidium Alliance, which are similar species of orchids that can be interbred to produce hybrid types. And a lot of those hybrid names are things like Colmenara, Wilsonara, um, Bialara, etc, etc. So they're all the result of interbreeding between many of these different species over sometimes a century since Oncidium and their cousins came into cultivation. So there's been a long history of hybridization to produce scent. This one has an amazing scent. Particular color, size, floriferousness, all manner of different things. And it is, mm, I'm going to put myself out there, it is fairly easy to say most hybrid Oncidium type orchids can take similar conditions. There are asterisks Exceptions, things like Miltoniopsis, which are in the Oncidium Alliance, but they do require cooler temperatures than perhaps other Oncidium hybrids might. Um, and there are other varigrees as well. But essentially, we could say that for the home grower, Oncidium hybrids are fairly easy and take fairly standard conditions and are fairly easy to get to flower and are very rewarding when they do. So the species ancestors of all the Oncidium Alliance, so that includes Oncidium, Odontoglossum, Gomesa, Miltonia, etc, etc, etc. They are all South American and grow in a variety of different climatic conditions. So some are montane growers in cool to cold forests, so they can take quite cool temperatures. Others are more at the tropical end. Others are moister. Some have distinct dry periods, some are more shade loving, some like much brighter light, etc, etc. You can imagine it's a big continent, lots and lots of different environments where these orchids have evolved over time. But the hybridization of plants does tend to standardize to some degree their care. So with the hybrid Oncidiums, I don't think you really have to worry too much perhaps about the ancestor origins. So with my Oncidiums, I either grow them outdoors all year under cover, which means they are not rained on, but they are subject to cool, cold nighttime winter minimums and also the heat of summer. Or I have them outdoors in summer and then I bring them indoors in winter where they are in still a fairly cool position, but a very bright one. So in the southern hemisphere, that's north facing and they get quite bright indirect light throughout the winter period. And I made a grow space video which shows you exactly where they are and I'll link that above and below. So I think for the home grower, Oncidiums are great because once you figure out where they are optimal in your house, then they just reward you often with two bloomings a year. So the flowering cycle, we're in our mid-summer in Melbourne. Can you believe it? I am wearing a jumper because we are having an Arctic blast. It's three or four days of literally winter conditions. Don't know about you, but as an orchid grower, I just said all these plants outside that can take the cool. Well, a lot of my plants that are outside at the moment are the ones I would bring in in winter when it gets cold. And at the moment, our nighttime minimums are getting to that dangerous point. So I'm a little anxious for these few days. Anyway, what can you do? 
And here, goodness me, look at the size of that. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is my Miltasia Lavender Kiss Lavender Tassi. Now, Miltasia, again, is a mix of various different species of orchids um, in the Oncidium Alliance to produce very vigorous grass. Look at that. And this is one we're going to repot now. So let's get to the whole when do you repot an Oncidium. Well, the question is, I guess, whenever the plant needs it. First thing to bear in mind is, like many orchids, most of the ancestor species are epiphytes, so they like a free-draining mix and they like to be quite constricted in their pot. So don't overpot them, pot them down. The smallest pot you can really get the root system into. First rule of thumb, small pots. Second point then is, well, when might you repot it? Well, when it needs to. Now, this one, as you can see, well, to be honest, I know it looks mad, but you could actually leave that for another season because it's not super crazy. I mean, it's borderline crazy, isn't it? Making a run for the hills. <laughs> but anyway, I am going to repot it because this has been in this pot now for over two years. So whatever medium is in there is probably well past its use by date. And I think the plant would just benefit from a refresh. So you want to repot an Oncidium ideally when it's producing a new growth because the new growths produce new roots and the new roots are going to be perhaps more vigorous and more adventurous if they're in a new medium. However, if you look at this orchid, you see plenty of room. There's absolutely no need to repot that. Also, it's in bloom. So I certainly wouldn't be repotting this while it's blooming, even though it has a new growth. Even if perhaps you thought it did need to be repotted, I would wait until that flower spike has died. Now this plant, the flower spike, has died and it's been cut and we have a new growth here and a new growth here. So if this orchid needed repotting, i.e. the pot was too small or the, the medium was too old, now would be a good time. Those, those new growths are sort of maturing. They're starting to produce new roots at the base, an ideal time, even though it is midsummer. Uh, you just wouldn't do it on a super hot day. That's a pretty obvious rule of thumb with any repotting, really. Don't do it in extremes of weather, either cool or hot. But if I needed to, I would be potting this now. So of course, these growths on hybrid oncidiums could occur at any point in the year. Generally, spring's not a bad time to repot most orchids. So if you happen to be in a point where you've got your new growths and your new roots appearing and your flower spike dead in its spring, go for it. But this one is getting a repot today and it's midsummer. Just so happens it is literally freezing today. So it's a great time to repot it. It has huge numbers of new growths, huge numbers of new roots, and it's really starting to break out of the pot. So I'm gonna repot that one now because it's midsummer. There's also no blooms. This hybrid Mitasia only blooms once a year for me. And that is usually in uh, late winter. That's the other thing to bear in mind. You don't want to interrupt the cycle. So all of these growths are still quite new. That's the perfect time to repot them. If the growth is more mature and it's kind of verging on the flowering, not a great time to do it. So while the, the growth is still young and in its growth spurt, that's a great time to repot. The other time to repot is when you get a seedling. Now this one is called Colmenara Masai Red Star. So it is the same type of hybrid as this one. So it'll take fairly similar conditions. Probably then might only flower once a year for me, you never know. This is a packet that I got from a hardware store and it was exactly $10 as you can see. These can be hit and miss. Uh, it depends on the supplier. Obviously it depends how long the plant's been in its little cryo crib. But you can see through the plastic that the leaves are still quite green and it's quite beautiful. So here's an interesting case in point. This is the first growth, the first pseudobulb. Here we have a new growth. And what you can see quite clearly at the bottom there is new roots starting to come. So as a seedling, this is the perfect time to repot this. Also, seedlings are often in plugs, although this one is in sphagnum moss, which is fine. So it could perhaps stay in that for another year because it's in quite fresh sphagnum moss. But I do like to get my seedlings out and about, have a look at the roots and make sure everything's tickety-boo. So I'm going to repot this one too. And plant lovers, I have got a surprise for you. <gasps> Ta-da! Look at that. Now, I have used, in many of my videos, pre-drilled pots, which I got from a specific supplier who said he would probably never get them again, pre-COVID, blah, 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 supply chain issues, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, they were very handsome. So oh, many of you said, Matthew, drill your own pots. I thought, oh God, must I? Okay. Anyway, I got handy, I got crafty, and I drilled myself some pots. 
surprisingly, very easy. I was frightened the pots might break, that they'd be too brittle, all those sorts of things, but no, it was very easy. So this is what I did, and I've got some footage of me doing it, which I'll drop in now. First thing you will need, obviously, is your pots. Second thing is diamond tipped drill bits. Now, the drill bits you want are going to be basically the size of the hole that you want. You can get really small ones for small pots and really big ones if you want much larger holes in a bigger pot. So I got two. I got a small diameter and a larger one. This was the larger one. And the guy in the hardware shop made a great suggestion. He said, get an old credit card, drill that first to use it as a template to drill through. Because the surface is round, the drill won't be able to grip because it's curved, it'll bounce around. So use that plastic card as a guide to keep the drill bit in its place. Great advice. So I had my old cinema sort of frequent flyer pass. Remember when we used to go to cinemas? Who does anymore? Exactly. So I drilled that card because I'm never using it again. Sorry, Nova Cinema in Melbourne. Next thing obviously you need is a drill and I used a cordless drill so there would be no issue about electricity with water because you also need running water to keep the area wet and cool as you're drilling because it gets very hot. And so off I went. Now if you had a workshop you could perhaps clamp the pot I don't have a workshop with a bench with clamps, so I clamp them in my knees. Now, there isn't much hazard involved in this because those diamond drill bits aren't sharp. So even if you were to slip and sort of get yourself, you're not gonna drill a hole in your leg. And it's quite a warm day, so I was able to have the running water running over it as I drilled. And I just used my hose on a sort of a trickle and I was able to just with one hand keep it flowing on the area and with the other drill the pot. Relatively easy. Uh, as you can see, I got completely drenched in the process. So it is messy. Make sure you're in an area where you can get messy. There's a lot of um, terracotta dust that comes out. So if you've got a driveway or a lawn or somewhere outside, you can do it. That is the best bet. And ta-da, look at the results. So I did some small ones, some large ones, and this is the pot. I'm going to repot Miltasia Lavender Kiss Lavender Taffy. Okay, well, I think we should clear the decks and repot the seedling and repot the biggie. But before we do that, let's just do a little maintenance on some of these. Okay, so a little maintenance. So what I'm just doing is I'm just snipping off these sort of manky brown ends. You see this one here? Now, sometimes the leaf might just got a bit of too much sun or a bit too much cold or it's aging. Or when you bought the orchid, the leaves weren't that healthy. So just because, you know, we're all aestheticians, aren't we, in the orchid world, I just trim off all those nasty ends of the leaves so that the plant looks much more healthy and attractive. Now with some house plants, if you cut the leaf, the whole leaf will die, but not with Oncidium orchids. So that leaf has been cut before and you see the leaf still remains. So it's still able to photosynthesize and do all its magic. Just an aesthetic thing really. Now, if you do have yellowing leaves or aging leaves on your Oncidium, don't worry if like this one, they're on the older back bulbs, because as you can see this back bulb now has no leaves. Well, it's got one, but it did have more. It's quite natural for the older bulbs as they age to lose their leaves and you're just left with the raw shriveled bulb. Leave that there because it still has juice and, and things to offer the plant. Ultimately, it will brown and die. And then when you repot it next, that would be the time to cut off that dead back bulb. But in the meantime, just leave them. Don't be alarmed if they start to lose their leaves. What you want, of course, is your new leaves to be green and healthy and beautiful. So there we go. There's just a little maintenance of this one. It's now looking much prettier, so we can enjoy that fabulous fragrance. Okay, now let's look at this baby. Miltasia Lavender Kiss Lavender Taffy. I will be quite honest and say, because this is such a reliable bloomer and such a reliable grower, I just leave it. I literally don't even pick it up, which is terrible because one of the things you should do is constantly pick up your orchids to have a look to see if they've got an insect infestation or something awful's going on or that they're happy or they've got root rot or they've got a new growth or a flower spike. This one though, I just know what it does. And it's in the same spot. It flowers for me once a year, it's super healthy. But as you can see, this flowered for me and I haven't yet cut off the old flower spikes and there's some old leaves in there. So once again, let's just do a little maintenance of this one. So I'm just gonna take out these old flower spikes. And as you can see, the bulb that that spike came from is still healthy and beautiful. 
it is producing new growth already. So I just want to take out that spike. And as you can see, it is right down there in the junction. And all you do is snip it off as close to that base point as you can, really just for aesthetic reasons. And there we go, we've removed our old flower spike. Uh, the other thing is we can see here a very old desiccated leaf, which if I just pull it, <laughs> <laughs> is going to come off. So you can see that little junction there is where it's connected to the pseudo bulb. So it's a natural process that that leaf should have died. It's an older bulb and it's shedding its leaves. And the other thing that we will see are these old leaf sheaths. And it is a great idea to pull these off gently. You can snip them as well because they can provide little havens for all sorts of beasts. So when you're doing your Oncidium tidy up, a great idea just to sometimes pull all of those little remnants off, pull it down and across rather than up, because if you pull it up, you might yank the plant out. So just be gentle in your brutality. There's a different plant leaf completely. There we have another old leaf. You see, I am so naughty at looking after this. Here is another dead uh, leaf from it. Already it's starting to look better. And now because the plant's so big there is another flower spike in here dead one to remove there we go and this one here oh two more goodness this is covered in flowers when it blooms it's the most reliable bloomer and because it's so reliable i have been madly buying myself miltasias so let's just have a look we had four flower spikes off this one this this winter late winter spring Fabulous, They're the most beautiful color uh, and fragrant too. Fantastic plant. Right, so we've got rid of lots of our old growths. As you can see, it's looking quite healthy. There is this yellowing leaf here. I am gonna leave that though until it's a little bit yellower and it's actually decided to, to finish itself. And as you can see from the growth, let's take the tag off. This is sort of the original heart of the plant and it's grown either side with all these uh, new growth. So Miltasia, as you can imagine, has Miltonia in its genealogy and the Miltasias are real runners along the surface with rhizomous growth. So not dissimilar to this, but more pronounced. So this one certainly has the characteristics of that ancestor. Okay, I'm going to swivel the camera around and repot our seedling and this. Okay, so we have sphagnum moss, a bit of charcoal, a bit of perlite and a bit of medium-sized bark. And we have slow release fertilizer. Apologies for the dirty container. I'm a real gardener. Six month release rather than 12 because you don't want to be releasing fertilizer during the, the colder months, ideally. And then we also have mycorrhizal fungi. Apologies for the very, very manky packet. I'll put the link below. Now, mycorrhizal fungi lives in the soil, lives in all soil, actually, all healthy soil, and it promotes healthy root growth by developing a symbiotic relationship with the roots of all plants to help them extract the nutrients from the medium that they're growing in. Very useful to add. It won't hurt the plant. All it can do is benefit it. So wherever you are in the world, you'll be able to find mycorrhizal fungi that you can sprinkle in to your mix. Okay, first thing to do is just to unpop this. Oh dear, first thing I can see. Oh no, it's just a stick. I thought that was a dead root. So this seedling would have been grown in a flask and then when it was deflasked, each of the little seedlings would have been individually potted in this size pot with sphagnum moss, which is a great way to bring up new seedlings. As you can see, the moss is really, really fresh and healthy. So that could easily stay in there for a whole year. Oh, what I can see there is slime and a chewed root. Oh my goodness. And there it is. There is a slug. So you see, I am so grateful. Look, it's moving and alive, that evil thing. The slug is eating all the roots. Well, slug, I hate to say it, but your day is nigh. Look at that. Oh my goodness. Well, there we go. Aren't we lucky we investigated? So it's only munched that root having them go at that one but all the other root tips no ah some of them are still healthy some of them have been nibbled anyway just in the nick of time let's remove some of this sphagnum moss hmm that is very very disturbing goodness me i'm so glad i got to this seedling today <gasps> imagine it would have been rootless so there you go plant lovers be warned evil slugs the good news is though it is a seedling 
and it is really in its growth spurt. So we've got, see that fresh root tip there? And we have new roots emerging here. Not such a problem at this point, I don't think. But if we'd left it another day or so, that slug could well have eaten everything. Yowza. Okay, there we are, our beautiful, healthy seedling. And now we're going to repot it in that pot. So generally what I do is just a sort of a healthy mix of all of these parts. So the sphagnum moss to retain moisture, perlite, moisture, aeration. The bark is sort of large enough to still be aerated, but not too big for the roots of the oncidium. And charcoal, once again, just to lighten the mix. So I will just do a little bit of a mix. We'll put sphagnum in first. We'll put a little bit of bark, a little bit of charcoal, a little bit of perlite, give it a little mix. Add our few grains of slow release fertilizer into there like that. A little dash of mycorrhizal fungi. That's what it looks like. And literally one, two little dashes. Like putting hot chili powder into something, not too much. Then we are simply going to pop our plant in there and then just fill it around with a little mix of sphagnum. A bit of bark, a bit of charcoal, a bit of perlite. Of course, you can pre-mix it all, which would certainly help. And I will when we come to pot the larger orchid. Just a little bit of sphagnum near that new root that's coming out. A little bit of bark to keep it in place. And there we go. I'll give that a good watering now with a seaweed-based solution diluted to about one-tenth. And that is good to go once we have written the label for it. Okay, time to repot the big miltasia. So we've got all our ingredients here, like making pastry. Excellent. All right, basic oncidium mix. I would use that for any type of oncidium, really. Okay, so what I have done is soaked the pot and the medium just to loosen up the medium and hopefully uh, enable me to get it out. And then I'm just going to do a little bit of leverage work with my seed prodder trying to, of course, protect all these new roots. No, that is not gonna work. So this, this is one of the negatives of using clay pots. Plant lovers, that the, the plant can just get really fixed. So it is time to sacrifice the pot. There we are. Oh, goodness me. There we are. Now I'm just kind of brutally cutting off a lot of these old dead roots. Nothing going on there. Those are dead. Now I'm actually gonna leave a lot of these old roots because it's gonna give the plant stability. And as you can see, we have all of these new roots. You can see them all in there, which will be growing down into the medium. And actually, you know, as these roots are decomposing, using those nutrients. So I don't really think I'm gonna do a great deal more with this, I don't think. Just pull off some obvious stragglers, like that one. Okay, so I've removed as much as I'm going to remove. There's not much old medium to take out at all. <laughs> what happens to it? Isn't that funny? It just gets absorbed into goodness. Anyway, so there is our root ball. I am now going to pot it into our new pot. So luckily we have some, some crocs of the old pot just to fill in the holes at the bottom there. And then we are going to put in a ton of our pre-mixed mix. There we go. Then we are putting in a little bit more slow release fertilizer than perhaps normal because it's such a big vigorous plant. And again, a really healthy dose of mycorrhizal fungi. As we can see, certainly benefited this one. Place our plant in its new home, maintaining roughly the same plant height as before. And then we go in and backfill. Well, <laughs> there we are, plant lovers. Miltasia, lavender kiss, lavender taffy, all potted up. Goodness me. 
what an operation that was. And I must confess, generally when I do repot my orchids from terracotta, they do come out quite easily once you soak them, but that was just a beast. So alas, the meat tenderizer had to come out and we lost a pot. Hey ho, so be it. So there we are. There is our Oncidium check-in, our Oncidium Alliance check-in. There's our little seedling all potted up, ready for a good watering with a seaweed-based tonic. The Oncidiums that are in bloom, I keep in the house while they're in bloom because they're so beautiful. And then they're either indoors or outdoors in summer. Um, some of them, as I said, I keep indoors in winter. Once they have finished flowering, they go back to wherever it is that they are living happily. And ah, once you find the sweet spot in your home or outdoors that they thrive in, you're on because they will just love it. They will bloom for you. They're super reliable, relatively easy. The only pest issue I ever have really, well, as we just saw, slug, that evil thing. Otherwise though, it is merely bugs for me. That's the thing with the ones indoors. And I use a variety of treatments. If there's just a few mealy bugs, I use an old toothbrush with a little bit of rubbing alcohol and I just wipe them off and keep an eye on it. If you notice that you've missed it and the infestation is quite strong, I do use a spray, uh, an insecticide spray, which is specific to chewing and sucking insects. Depends where you are, doesn't really matter what it is. The oil-based ones can really work. Sometimes you need a bit of a heavy hitter if you've got a big infestation. That's really the only problem for me. And then I guess the final point is, do they need a rest period? Well, essentially, if it's growing or doing something, it's gonna need water and fertilizer. And as these hybrids can grow throughout the year, they don't really need a rest period. I think if the flower has died off and there is no new growth, you might wanna just dial it down a little bit and not keep it too wet and just wait because that new growth is the point which starts to get all the new root activity and it starts to really draw moisture and nutrients from the soil. So while you're waiting for the new growth, you might want to really dial down your watering and feeding because the plant's kind of in a period of stasis. So rule of thumb, I guess, if it's doing something, water it, feed it gently. If it's not, don't. So there we are, plant lovers. I hope that has been interesting. It was certainly interesting to see slugs eating my seedling roots. Oh my goodness, I've never actually seen that before. So there we go. <gasps> Warning and case in point. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Do hit subscribe if you like this video. And if you want to see more and watch my continuing adventures, they're every Friday. Otherwise, take care wherever you are. I hope your Oncidiums are loving life and I look forward to seeing you next week.